I thought, being it's, it's the introduction, what I would do is actually just concentrate on um, telling you some stories about what's been going on in uh, safety and quality uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. And um, this is probably one of the reasons why we're here. This is the paper from the BMJ published two years ago suggesting that the third leading cause of death in America was actually systemic medical error, so probably our fault. Um, and uh, it was published in the BMJ. I'm pleased it was published in the BMJ. The editor of BMJ Safety and Quality didn't want it published in the BMJ. They wanted to bury it in one of their supplements to BMJ Safety and Quality because they said this would scare people too much to actually engage in safety and quality. So we could be scared and we could be scared off by what we hear, uh, but I think we're still going to persist, um, and that's probably because you're surgeons and it's probably because I work with you that I will persist as well. So uh, what makes healthcare safe? Who is responsible for making healthcare safe? And who's responsible for making it unsafe? Uh, and who's responsible for getting it back to being safe again? Those are the sort of questions that I think we have to ask ourselves because we're really responsible for what we've got to do. And we can see that it could be us, it could be the nurses. There's always a nurse to blame. We can usually find several of them. Um, there's always possibly um, some responsibilities around professionalism and honesty. Um, and maybe the insurers can help us. Maybe the law courts can help us. Or perhaps the law courts get in the way when we're trying to do a good job. But those are the issues I'm going to address. And we'll t I'm just going to tell some stories as background. Now, this is the only question I'm going to ask you. And it's only for the surgeons. So any anaesthetists can sit on their hands for the minute. Does anybody know what the shape of that graph is? Risk-adjusted complication rate here and surgical skill rating peer-reviewed by your own colleagues. Anybody, any ideas? How does that look? Do you believe it? OK. Um, originally, performance monitoring, which is what Berkmeyer was doing there, five years ago, um, was introduced, or one of the early introductions was by a very um, ingenious and very intuitive guy called Mark Shasson, who was the Director of Medical Services for New York State. And what he said was, if you as a hospital or you as an individual want to do anything cardiological or cardiac surgical, you have to collect my database. And I'm actually not going to allow your hospital to be accredited or you to be accredited to do these operations unless you collect my data. And so over there in New York State, he got all his surgeons and he got all his cardiologists to start collecting data. And he kept it in a database and he fed it back to them anonymously. And after three years, he got a 40% reduction in risk-adjusted mortality for routine coronary artery surgery. And that was work with Ed Chasson, who was his statistician. And everybody said, that's amazing. It's, a, it's fantastic. And they did the same thing in New Hampshire. Plume and his colleagues and O'Connor um, did exactly the same thing, because they couldn't believe that New York State could have such an impact on risk-adjusted outcomes. And they did the same thing. And within three years, they found that their risk-adjusted mortality had fallen by 28%, not by doing anything, just by feeding back the risk-adjusted outcomes to the surgeons involved. And they were all very impressed. And in fact, Mark Shasson was so impressed he had a dinner party. And he invited some uh, journalists to the dinner party and he explained that he actually had this incredible information but he couldn't let anybody know. It was entirely confidential and if anybody got to find out, it would ruin his data collection. And the journalist said, but hang on, isn't that quite important information for the public to know which are the good hospitals and which are the good doctors? And, they, and he said, no, no, you can't do that. You will ruin the trust that the profession has in my project if you do that. And in fact, the argument got quite heated. And the final comment from the journalist as they left was, we'll see you in court. And Newsday, which was essentially today, tonight, or one of those evening television programs, took Mark Shasson and the Department of Health in New York State to court to get that information out into the public domain. And Mark Shasson stood up in court and he said, under cross-examination, this will ruin the best quality insurance, quality assurance program in New York State ever if you release this information into the public domain. 
And the judge said, that's a very important point, Dr. Shastin. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, the um, uh, newspaper produced their witnesses. And their witnesses says, when a patient goes to a doctor for cardiac surgery, the single most important thing he needs to know is, is he going to die? And this information tells us that. And the judge said, that's a very important point. I'll have to weigh this up in my judgment. And in his judgment, he said, actually, when patients go to see doctors, they want to know how good their doctors are. And if you've got information that informs that debate, then it has to be in the public domain. That afternoon, he ordered the Department of Health in New York State to release this information. And the next day, on the New York Times front page, was not the risk-adjusted mortality, but the crude mortality of every cardiac surgeon in New York State. And it hasn't made any difference to the program, and it hasn't made any difference to the surgeons. In fact, if you talk to the surgeons now, they say it's a good starting point for a discussion of risk for individual patients. Okay, and Stephen Shortell observed the same thing across in um, San Francisco. Um, and when they did, sorry, when they did their um, study, it was on radical prostatectomies in, within a year, just by feeding back the outcomes of, this, of the data, of the um, operations that were being performed, they demonstrated a reduction in complication rates. So getting your results may well be quite important. And it's probably important in terms of honesty. This is another study about honesty in healthcare, a chap called Steve Craman. Now, Steve Craman is from Lexington, Kentucky, and he used to be the director of medical services for the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and he decided when he was getting reports from his incident reporting system, he was deciding that he should share the information with the patient. So this was way back in the mid-80s. He was saying, that's so important, I have to tell the patient that the hospital made a mistake. We didn't give antibiotics, you've had a wound infection, you've had longer in hospital than you should have, You'd have to cut, you've had to come back for extra operations, we will compensate you for that, we will speak to your solicitor, hospital solicitor, the hospital solicitor was Virginia, she's always VHAM on all the papers, because otherwise it would be Virginia Ham, and uh, so she, she used to sit down with another solicitor and they would compensate the patients for what went wrong. And for the first three years, their costs went up, and they were thinking of stopping the study. But after, for the next 16 years, the costs fell because they were actually reducing the amount of litigation that turned up. And everybody said, ah, oh, it's a Veterans Affairs Hospital. It's not a proper teaching hospital, not a busy hospital, not a proper hospital. And it wasn't a prospective study. So we can't trust this data. So they then did the study again, um, and they put it into... Um, the University of Michigan, and these are the results that they got. They found that within four years, they managed to get a two-thirds reduction in their legal bill. They reduced the number of cases, and this is essentially, we think, reductions in, in vexatious litigation. This is the vexatious litigation agreement because they trust the hospital. What uh, Steve Cramman said in Lexington, Kentucky, was that if a patient felt that the hospital had done something wrong and not treated them correctly, they would go to a solicitor in Lexington, say the Slater and Gordon of Lexington, Kentucky. And if and, and Slater and Gordon would say to them, has the hospital told you they've done something wrong? And if the patient said no, then the solicitors wouldn't take the case on on a no-win, no-fee uh, basis because they knew that the hospital was honest enough to tell the patient the truth and that was how they eliminated all the vexatious litigation. And they think the same thing happened in Michigan. So with these wonderful results, they tried to get it published. And they called it Honesty in Medicine. And they eventually got it published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But it took them over a year to get the data published. And the reason was, everybody said, all the reviewers said, isn't that what hospitals do anyway? We can't publish this. This is normal practice. And they wouldn't publish it until they changed the authors. <laughs> and then they demonstrated that they did get reduced legal costs over four years, and it wasn't a Veterans Affairs Hospital. It was one of the hospitals that we work in. So honesty there was demonstrating that it was actually quite important in reducing costs for the profession.
This is a paper that I published with Tom Fords, who's a lecturer and reader now in law and medicine at ACU, at um, yeah, the Australian uh, National University, ANU, sorry. Um, and what we proposed uh, way back in the early part of this century was that actually doctors have a fiduciary duty to tell patients when something goes wrong. It's actually fiduciary duties are to do with an imbalance in the power relationship between two parties to an agreement. And we would say there's actually an imbalance between the doctor here and the patient here, and the doctor therefore has a fiduciary duty to tell the patient when something goes wrong. And we put this into the press. It actually happens to be a journal that um, Robert Francis, who did the mid-staffs inquiry, um, read as well. And so when he was producing his report on mid-staffs, he rang me, in fact, he Skyped me twice from his um, chambers in London, and he came up with a duty of candor, which was very similar to the fiduciary duty to tell patients about what's going wrong in their care. So across jurisdictions, we can begin to agree some of the things that we may have to do. But in fact, it's relatively easy to see that it's about being honest and being transparent. Now, this is the last point I want to make because I haven't got long. And um, this was clinician engagement. Recently, we've had work coming out of uh, Safer Care Victoria um, and the Department of Health and Human Services which is talking about engaging clinicians. And it's these four items, setting the agenda, informing clinicians, involving clinicians, and then we get empowered. And that's important in clinical engagement. And we'd been thinking about this for some time in Geelong, and we said, actually, it's more important than that. It's a number. You can actually calculate clinical engagement and the important thing about this paper was that it had not only a doctor and the clinical risk unit involved, but it had the... missed. <laughs> it had the director of nursing and the chief executive involved as well. And that was important because it meant that the organisation was involved and the organisation wanted its doctors to be involved in what was happening in its, in its hospital. And what we said was, it's the percentage of patients receiving guideline compliant treatment. And we've recently, we're in a piece of work we're doing with a group in Ireland, in Cork, um, where we're looking at the number of guidelines that would exist for a busy general hospital that's got peds and obstetrics and general surgery and all the other specialties. And we think it's about 200. 200 guidelines that actually impact on outcomes. There's a lot of guidelines that don't relate to outcomes at all. But the guidelines that impact on outcomes, we think, is about 200. And we think that clinical engagement is the number of patients going through your hospital that get guideline-compliant treatment. We're looking at antimicrobials in cesarean sections. We, we know we've got 98% compliance because we go and check with the prescriptions and we check with the medication charts. Abdominal wall surgery, it's 96%. And we know here we've got good outcomes. We haven't got deep wound infections in those patients. And we think that's because we've got guideline compliant care and we think it's related to outcomes. Bowel surgery, not so good. We're doing a targeted review. We're looking for nudge factors. How can we get this up to here? Because here we're seeing some worse outcomes. So we think it's important. We think it's the way forward and guess what? We've got other people wanting to do it. The cardiologists want to join in. They want to know about oral medications during acute myocardial infarction. We've got people wanting to know about DVT prophylaxis and pulmonary embolus following hospitalisation. And we've even got the oncologists wanting to know whether we're complying with the guidelines on febrile neutropenia. The chest physicians, community-acquired pneumonia, do we follow the guidelines? People are actually quite engaged in that because they're their patients and they want to know how good they are. So we think we can move forward, and we think we will, and I haven't got any more stories. It's being weeded out by solicitors coming to an agreement.